Hey there, marketing analytics students. In this video, we're going to do a complete end-to-end -end data driven segmentation project using RapidMiner. As you've seen in the previous videos, there's a three step sequence we move through when doing data driven segmentation with that very first step being collecting data. Now we're going to assume that the data has been provided to us by some marketing research firm or someone else who did the work. But let's orient ourselves a little bit to what we're going to be working with. Our objective is to segment the craft beer market of San Diego. And when we were collecting data on the mindset of the craft beer consumer, there were a series of questions that we asked on a one to five point Likert scale. Notice that some of the questions are about the taste of beer. A good beer must be thirst quenching, not too heavy or hoppy. But other questions are about broader concepts related to craft beer, like drinking a really rare beer sounds thrilling to me. There's our little marketing research angel providing this data to us. In addition, as required during the first step of data-driven segmentation, we've also captured some behavioral measures of our craft beer consumers. Basically, we found out what beer styles they prefer to drink, whether they're India Pale Ale people, Pilsner people, Amber people, Porter people, or, like, or other types of beer. In, a diff in addition, we have some demographic measures, their age, their income, and so on. And in total, we collected data about 300 craft beer consumers in San Diego. And the second step of the data-driven process is where we really come in. We're going to try to segment this market based on what's in their mind, using their mindset variables that we captured previously during step one. So how do we successfully market to these types of craft beer, uh, craft beer drinkers? Well, we're going to try to see if we can peer into their minds by using that survey data. Because they all may drink craft beer, but their needs, preferences, and attitudes and beliefs about craft beer might be entirely different. So the way we communicate and market to them would be different. Consider the following. The woman on the far left really enjoys trying rare beers, whereas the individual on the far right really enjoys explaining how the beer was made. It makes them feel smart and special. These are all real motivations that craft beer drinkers have. We want to make sure that we're tailoring our communications to what they think inside their minds, because their minds are what drive them to behave. Now, there's a problem that does emerge immediately if we rely on the mindset of the consumer to base our segmentation scheme. A very simple question emerges. Well, how do you actually target those consumers? If you're relying on what's inside their mind, how do you find them in the real world? You can't just peer into people's minds. For the 300 people that we actually collected data on, yes, but for the many thousands or millions of craft beer drinkers otherwise, we can't automatically read their minds. So we need to solve this problem. One possible solution is that we use the behavior of the craft beer drinker to predict what's inside their mind. So these individuals were all drinking different styles of beer. Let's presume that that means that those were the styles of beer they really preferred. By knowing what they're drinking, which a marketer can easily observe, maybe we can reliably predict about what's inside their mind, which is the segment that we were trying to reach. Another solution is using demographic variables. Demographic information is usually easily visible or easy to target within the market. So for these four different individuals, we might consider their identification as being a man or a woman and their income levels as easily accessible information that we could use to target the underlying mindset of those consumers. So now that we understand the relationship between the data we, that we've collected, and our intentions to build both a segmentation scheme based on needs and the mindset and the use of demographic or behavioral data to actually predict that underlying mindset, let's break down the specific tasks that we're going to do in our segmentation activity. So if our objective is to build an actionable marketing segmentation scheme of the San Diego craft beer drinker, our first task is we're gonna segment the market. We're gonna use that uh, San Diego craft beer drinker data and we're gonna generate clusters, which are our segments, using the k-means clustering algorithm in app RapidMiner. For our second task, after we settle on our final clustering solution or segmentation scheme, we're going to try to predict which clusters people belong to by using either their beer style preference or the demographic characteristics. We'll build these prediction models in RapidMiner using decision trees. Now, for this particular tutorial, I've already provided to you a completely finished end-to-end -end rapid minor process file that lays out all of the steps and all of the activities that we need to do to complete this process. My expectation is that you'll have imported that process file in rapid minor and you're ready to run it. 
making sure you change that Excel file, right? And once we've done that, we're ready to proceed. While I'm showing you some of the results and talking through them, I will point out to you a few of the new operators that we're using in this process. But the extensive details of the other parameters for the other operators, I leave for you to review yourself by walking through the process file. This is the overview of our process file. It looks like a lot, but let's break down its overall objectives here. Here is a subprocess, and inside the subprocess is where we're actually going to do the clustering. In other words, we're going to generate our market segments inside this operator. Then, with our segments created, our next task is to try to predict which of those segments someone belongs to based on either using demographic variables or beer style preference variables. So there's two more subprocesses over here. Each one of those is a prediction model subprocess that's trying to predict cluster membership. This is just an overview of the entire process. You have to double click inside each one of these subprocesses to see the subroutines. So in our first task, the clustering task, I want to show you some of the features that we're going to be tweaking or potentially adjusting as we're testing out different clustering solutions. We're going to then run the model, and I'll show you one example where we run the model using a certain number of mindset variables uh, based on a five segment solution. So when I run this, uh, there's something that you'll probably want to do as well. Inside your Rapid Miner software, you'll want to right click on this particular uh, sub process here. And by right clicking on it, you'll be able to add a breakpoint after. Breakpoints are really useful in Rapid Miner. What they do is when a process is running in Rapid Miner, anywhere there's a breakpoint is added, it'll stop the process and it'll immediately show you, the user, what results you have. This is useful if you want to sort of diagnose different problems in your model or see sort of what's happening as you're working through all the steps. So if you single click onto this subprocess operator, you'll notice that it's called a work on subset operator. So if you search in the operators menu for work on subset, you'll, you'll find this. And all this does is it takes your entire data file and allows you to select just a small subset of all of the variables you want to work with. So inside the subprocess, we're going to actually run the clustering algorithm or the segmentation algorithm. And we don't at this stage want to include preferences for beer styles, such as preferences for amber, blondes, browns, hefeweizens, IPAs, lambics, and so on, nor do we want to include any demographic information. And we just want to select a certain subset of that mindset beer preference variables. In this example, rather than grabbing all of the available ones, I only grabbed six. Next, let's double click into that operator and let's look deep inside that subprocess where we're doing the clustering. There's only one new operator in here that we really need to pay close attention to right now. The rest just generate reports. And that's our clustering operator here. This is the operator that's actually going to do the k-means. There's a very important parameter here that we need to tweak. Take a look at the K parameter here. Right now it's set to five. That's something that we type in. And it's literally telling RapidMiner, I want you to create a market segmentation scheme of five different market segments. You could just as easily change this to four, six, seven, eight, and so on. To make sure that you get the exact same results that I do, make sure you check the use local random seed option and set the number to 2600. And also, because we're going to need to use this clustering information for our prediction models downstream, make sure you have the add cluster attribute checked and the add as label checked. With all of this set up, you should be able to hit the run button in your Rapid Miner process file, and let's review the results of our clustering. Looking at the example set that came out of my results tab here, I can see that I now have my 300 records with a new label applied to it. And notice that the label goes from cluster zero to cluster four. Starting at zero, that means our clustering algorithm has taken all of these individuals and segmented them into one of five potential clusters. If we look at the cluster model visualizer report, we can start interpreting what each one of these clusters means. Taking a look at cluster zero, we can see that 66 of the 300 people or 22% of the market was assigned to this particular group. Further, we can look at this average distance number here. The way to interpret this average distance number is it tells us typically 
how often the actual data, in our case the customers, are either near or far away from the centroid. Remember, the centroid is the thing that we use to interpret what each segment is. So for cluster zero, because the average distance is low, that would imply that the people that belong to this cluster are relatively consistent with that centroid, meaning the centroid does a good job of representing them. On the other hand, for cluster one, the centroid number is, or I'm sorry, the average distance number is higher. That means that for cluster one, the, we can still characterize the overall market, but each individual in that market isn't as well represented by that characterization. Next, Rapid Miner actually gives us a nice little summary report here. We'll look at these results in more depth soon. And it's already telling us here that when we compare cluster zero to the other market segments, we can see that this cluster really likes knowing more about the details of craft beer. That was one of the questions we brought into our, uh, into our segmentation scheme. They like enjoying craft beer with friends and they really enjoy trying rare beers. So this group stands out from the other segments and on those particular mindset variables. The heat map report also gives us some insights into how the groups, I'm sorry, how each segment is similar or different from one another. You read the heat map coloration from top to bottom for each one of the variables. This question, the beer pref uh, drunk less question, dealt with the idea of people enjoying or preferring to drink a single craft beer rather than, rather than multiple beers. And what we can see here is that people that belong to cluster zero and two tended to agree with that, where people in cluster one and cluster three were less likely to agree with that. So we might be inclined to think that those people are, are, are those type of individuals who are inclined to drink more. In my opinion, this heat map report isn't quite as useful as the next chart we're going to be looking at, and that's the centroid chart. The centroid chart on the x-axis includes all six of the survey questions that we incorporated to segment our market. Each one of the colored lines represents one of the five clusters that we belong to, that we assigned uh, individuals to, and the y-axis represents the scale that these questions were asked on. And remember, for these particular questions, if you go back to the survey instrument that we used, they all range from one to five. So how do we interpret this type of chart? To provide a partial illustration, let's focus in on just cluster one for now. I circled all of the points that they break, that they reach based on these survey questions. After looking at these values for a while and thinking about what these values might mean relative to the other clusters, I came up with the following interpretation. I noticed that this particular segment isn't really into the details of craft beer, but they're willing to pay more for good beer. They like the idea of rare beer, and they would rather have one craft beer than many regular beers. On the other hand, relative to other groups, they don't really see craft beer as a great social experience, and they're not that big on supporting local craft beer. Now this group isn't very large. In fact, it was only 7% of the entire 300 respondents. So we'd interpret that as 7% of our market. But if I was to take a step back as a marketer and give this group a name, I might call these individuals pricey prestige drinkers. Um, they're the kind of drinker that maybe we could persuade to drink uh, say like a five ounce taster of a very rare or expensive barrel aged beer. So this is the kind of individual who they don't really want to know all the elaborate details, but if you tell them there's a very special beer and it costs you $12 for the privilege of drinking five ounces of it, you may have good luck selling to them. Now, I don't illustrate this here in this video, but at this point, we would have actually gone back and repeated that previous process multiple times. We would have looked back over our list of potential mindset variables, selecting those that we think are most important to segmenting our market and excluding others, sometimes bringing in ones that's, that we think are gonna do a good job of separating the market, pulling out those that don't seem to be as productive. In addition, we would test additional segmentation solutions. Instead of testing a five segment solution, I would probably explore a six and four segment solution. So this is an iterative process where we would test multiple different things, interpret those results like I just did, and I wouldn't stop until I've settled in on a market segmentation scheme where I think I can provide a useful description of each one of the segments. And I think each one of those segments are meaningfully different from one another as per interpreted by a craft beer marketer. For now, let's assume we nailed it in our very first try. 
the segmentation solution that I showed you here in this video is in fact the segmentation solution that we're going to use for the rest of the video. In this next step, we need, not, we need to now predict segment membership. Now in this task two process, if you go back to Rapid Miner, there's a few additional key parameters that we're going to need to tweak. So I'm now highlighting these particular sub-processes. Now keep in mind, each one of these sub-processes is exactly the same in terms of its, its design in Rapid Miner. There's only one difference. One of these sub-processes is designed to predict cluster membership using beer style preference, and the other is for demographics. Otherwise, they're the same. Again, for each one of these sub-processes here, I used the work on subset operator, and I selected a certain subset of beer styles, and I grabbed a certain subset of the demographic variables. Again, I grabbed the select ones that I did just to illustrate that you don't necessarily have to use everything that's available. And inside one of these sub-processes, I'm only showing one here using the beer preference, uh, we actually see a rapid minor process setup that's very similar to what we've done previously. We have here our prediction model, the decision tree, and I have the relevant parameters here showcased for you. You can reference those in your rapid minor process file. We then apply that model. We apply that model into the model simulation tool, which we've used before. And we also use that application of that model to report the overall performance of our decision tree. So now that we briefly reviewed the prediction model setup that we're using for each of the two approaches, let's take a look at one set of the results. So here's the decision tree prediction solution that I derived when I was trying to use only someone's beer preferences to predict which one of the uh, five market segments they belong to. First of all, notice the model never predicts that someone belongs to either cluster one or cluster three. So this, predictual, this particular prediction model does not successfully identify those individuals that belong to our mindset segments of one or three. At a glance here, though we do notice that the model seems to have an ability to identify those individuals who belong to cluster two. Notice that for people who strongly prefer IPAs and they strongly prefer Pilsners, now if you ignore their preferences for porters, whether they have a strong preference or not a strong preference, we still predict overall that they'll belong to cluster two. Let's take a look at this same model, but let's look at its predictive accuracy through a confusion matrix. Here's our, compu here's our confusion matrix result. First of all, notice that as, as we saw earlier, that our model never actually predicts that somebody belongs to either cluster one or cluster three. So beer style alone is not a very good predictor of those particular groups. Uh, how do we interpret the rest of this model? Well, the accuracy overall, it's accurate only 35% of the time at predicting which market segment someone belongs to. We just simply count up all of the diagonals, which are the correct predictions, and divide them by the total. Now, this isn't a great number, but keep in mind an accuracy of 35% is maybe not quite as terrible as we're used to thinking it might be. Um, in this prediction model, we're trying to predict what, if someone belongs to one of five potential groups. In all of the previous examples that we've ever had in this class, we've only been trying to predict two possible outcomes, whether someone churns or doesn't churn, for example. In this model, we're trying to predict whether or not someone belongs to one of five different segments. So of course, the complexity of that prediction uh, task uh, increases quite a bit. Just as a, a friendly reminder, how do we interpret the results if we're looking through the columns? Let's focus in on cluster four. Uh, we can see here that uh, this model was able to predict with 62.6% .6 accuracy those individuals that actually belong to cluster four. So you might notice over here, I've adjusted my inputs. So I was imagining an individual who strongly prefers IPAs and they strongly prefer Pilsners, but they don't have a strong preference for porters or ambers. So more of a lighter colored beer person rather than a darker colored beer person, if you will. And according to our model, it's basically a tie whether this model predicts that someone belongs to the cluster two segment or the cluster four segment. Um, even though it sort of edges the prediction over at cluster four here, it's, it's basically a coin toss. Um, so overall, our model isn't particularly confident that this type of beer drinker belongs to any group. However, um, if you combine uh, cluster two and cluster four together, we can say 
the model is pretty confident that this person belongs to either cluster two or cluster four. Um, and it's pretty confident that the, the, they don't belong to cluster zero, one, or three. Of course, all of this has to be taken with the caveat that overall, this model didn't have a particularly strong level of predictive accuracy. So in wrapping up this tutorial, we've completed an end-to-end -end data driven marketing segmentation process. We showed the sort of importance of blending both the analytics end of using uh, the data to derive solutions, but also the importance of using art, where the marketer has to sort of look at the results and come up with identities and uh, understanding of who these consumers really are, and in turn, how you might uh, promote or advertise to them based on that understanding. And also, let's keep in mind here that the results that were shown and discussed in this video series was built on a very small sample using very basic analysis. Now, in the real world, uh, if we were implementing this approach, we would use a much larger da uh, data set. We'd conduct many more analyses. We would do many different loops of segmentation solutions, try many more variables, and we would spend a bunch of time trying to interpret and understand those groups. And in addition, we would uh, not just use training data as we use in this video, but we would after using and building a model with a training data set, we would then validate uh, using the validation data set as well. I hope that you look forward to playing around with the different parameters within this process file yourself, interpreting the results and seeing if you can come up with a better way to identify and segment the craft beer drinker in San Diego and identify a superior way to actually target those individuals the craft beer industry needs your help.